the second talk of this session. So we welcome Delio Muniolo, uh, who will be talking about random evolution equations on graphs and beyond. So the floor is yours, Delia. Thanks. Thank you, Atuk. And uh, thank you to the organizers, Delia, to Jochen Gluck, who invited me here. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I have to explain, I think, what, uh, what's, uh, what this title is about. So. This uh, idea goes back to a discussion I was having many years ago with uh, Stefano Bonacorsi when uh, he was visiting me back then. It was in Ulm almost 10 years ago. And we were discussing about a toy model, which I will present you right now. So the idea is the following. So assume you have um, a system like an interval, say a zero, two interval. Um, and you have some kind of um, process on it, say a diffusion. And um, in the middle, you have um, a gate, uh, which acts, yes, yeah, so a point which acts as a gate. So Brownian particle diffuses, say, on this interval, goes to the left and then to the right and so on. And when it, when it reaches uh, the point one, it's, it gets reflected to the, to the left or if your Brownian particle is on the right, then uh, it just diffuses um, in this interval and then gets reflected when it touches the, the one. But well, sometimes um, the gate um, is opened, so you end up with, a, with a, just one larger zero to interval, so without any reflection in the middle. So the uh, the question we we had back then was the following: So, what happens uh, if you have if you keep on oscillating between diffusion on this system with with this reflecting gate in the middle, and then from time to time you switch to a system without gate? So you have just Neumann conditions at the um, endpoints of this larger interval, and then maybe you can get back and back and so on and so forth. So does this system, I mean, what kind of um, properties does this system have? Uh, so this must have been something like 2010 or even earlier. And then at a certain point, we, um, we left this topic because we, well, we had other things to do, I guess. Um, so a couple of years ago, I, so just to, to make it clear, so the, the idea is really that we want to, to go keep on uh, going back and forth between these two systems. And a couple of years later, I uh, started um, working on something, well, somehow slightly related. Because I was talking with a um, um, bioinformatician from, from Saarbrück, uh, and she was, um, she was introducing um, to Pavel Kurasov and myself, a model from um, theoretical biology about gene regulatory networks, uh, which can be formulated by means of this, um, of this evolution equation here. So you see um, F1 and F2 describe uh, the evolution of proteins in, um, in a cell. And then um, your cell can have different state of genes. So you basically, um, so this, this, um, um, this black part of the equation just describes the evolution of this um, protein numbers uh, if they would be um, left alone um, in two different states of the system. But the model requires that, in fact, um, the system is constantly switching back and forth between these two uh, gene states. And this is described by this... Um, uh, transition matrix here uh, that um, with certain parameters lambda and mu describe how likely it is that uh, what um, is uh, jumping to the next one and so on and so forth. So here in this case we have just two different gene states of the system is relatively easy. But even if this is so easy because the, the transport equation is not um, the nicest one, actually there is a there is huge literature about this kind of systems um, in particular about, well, uh, long-term asymptotics, because it's not very hard to see that the system is uh, well-posed with suitable uh, boundary conditions. So the hard part is to show, first of all, to describe the domain of the operator, and then to, this, to, to, to see what is the long-term behavior of this. So I have uh, listed a couple of uh, papers devoted to this topic here. 
uh, I think probably the most interesting one for, for us uh, when we started um, working on this was this by Benaim and co-authors, uh, where they proved that this uh, system converges with respect to a certain Wasserstein distance um, to, um, to a steady state. This was state of the art till the beginning of the uh, 2010s. Um, and then um, in, in a recent paper, which just got published in the Journal of Mathematical Biology, uh, as I was saying with Pavel Kurasov and Verena Wolf, we were able to, um, well, to, to weaken certain assumptions um, which were imposed early in the literature. And, um, and we actually, we were able to prove even convergence in L1 operator norm uh, of the um, semi-group governing the system towards a um, um, projector. So this is a nice uh, piece of uh, result, I think. But um, you see, this is a bit different from what I was describing in the toy model before, because in this case, we and so we have really continuous switching back and forth between two different states. And the previous case, I really wanted to allow for uh, jumps at discrete times. Um, this is probably harder mathematically, but on the other hand, I was thinking of, of, of diffusion equations. So probably we may use um, smoothing property of analytic semigroups to, to um, get better results. So this is what I am going to see. So just to, to make this pictorially easier, this is the picture I have in mind. So um, basically we have uh, different evolution equations um, at each node. So of, of this, um, this um, <laughs> Well, this picture, this this natto, if you wish. So each node is an evolution equation. You stay here for a while, and then at the next time step, uh, you freeze everything, and then uh, an alarm rings, and then you are told to jump to the next um, to the next system, to the next um, physical system, and then you let it evolve for a while uh, according to a certain evolution equation, and then uh, you move on to another evolution equation, and so on. So mathematically, what I'm talking about is the following. We have a certain ambient space, um, say x, and a very initial configuration, uh, small x is given. So you start with a certain evolution equation, which is this one. So a1 is just any um, well-behaved operator. And then between time 0 and capital T1, you just let the system evolve with initial condition x according to this evolution equation. So if you are lucky, then a1 will be a generator, and then um, everything is fine. So you let the system evolve, and then you freeze the system at time capital T1. Um, but then you can still keep the last state reached by the system, which will be e to the t1 a1 x, uh, as an initial datum from an, for a new evolution equation, which is this one. So you let the system evolve according to this evolution equation with this initial condition, then we'll freeze it again, and so on and so forth. So the system is not very difficult to describe. Of course, in order for everything to make sense, then you need um, that this um, final configuration is a, a feasible initial condition for this new one. So basically, you want, among other things, that uh, all these evolution equations are living in the same um, Banach space, at least an isomorphic corpus of the same Banach space. Uh, and then that this all this, uh, this operators A1, AM, and so on um, generate same groups. And then if uh, this very, I mean, relatively weak assumptions are satisfied, then uh, you um, end up with a family of operators described in the system. Well, it's not a semi group, of course, but it's a, it's a certain sense, it's a composition of, um, of semi groups. So you see, between um, T0 and T1, you just have the, sorry, between 0 and T1, you just have a, the first semi-group, and then you freeze, and then you compose with the second one, and so on. So you, you have a system like this, and then in the middle of an interval, you just add on the left this uh, very last um, system. Okay, so this pretty much settles the question, um, the issue of, of well -posedness. Um, so if you just define a function u like this, um, so you just apply this this um, propagator to the initial condition x, then you see that u is a nice um, it's a nice function and it's a calculated function. In fact, even a bit more uh, using the fact. So you can of course um, 
get better properties, uh, analytic properties, if the semigroups are better properties, for instance, if they are analytic, then the functions will be smoother almost everywhere, apart from just jumps at the capital T times. Um, you can use the um, ideal property of, of, um, of semigroups. So for instance, if uh, one of them is compact and the whole propagator will be a compact operator, you can go far and study trace class operators and so on. Uh, you can inherit um, positivity from the um, from the initial condition if all um, semigroups are positive and so on and so forth. So I don't want to go to 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 um, bother you with this um, relatively easy properties. The interesting question is uh, convergence, in fact, because um, this is much less clear. So the okay, we can express in this form. So if um, if d goes to infinity, then basically what you're starting is this product of, uh, of semigroups. So you have infinitely many, but in a certain sense, countably many um, operators. So this is TK, T capital, so capital TK plus one minus TK is a fixed time because these TK times are given. So this is just one exponential um, of certain number times matrix AK, uh, sorry, operator AK. And so far, um, so and so on and so forth for um, continuous many um, um, such exponentials. And the question is whether this um, product of exponentials converge. And um, well, this is not a very easy question. Um, so we were our first idea was to go back to the solution equation. Because in a certain sense, what we are describing is a system where your, um, yes, your, your um, evolution equation is changing. So maybe you can just incorporate, encode this change in the, um, in the operator A, so in the, in the generator. Uh, and in fact, there are a couple of results in this direction uh, that might at least give a hint of what's going on. So assume that your AT is, um, well, it's not only a, an operator and the generator, but in fact, it's associated with a quadratic form, say small at. And assume for simplicity, I mean, you can weaken this, but assume for simplicity, this, uh, this quadratic form is in fact symmetric and that the associated operator is compact with Hoban. And assume also that the spectral bound um, of this operators, of all these operators is constantly equal to zero. Um, and that the uh, range of the spectral projector um, of these operators at the same as at each time t is constant and constantly given by uh, the um, space band by a certain vector phi. So it's always the same. So the, the, all these um, guys have the same uh, null space and the null space of all, each of these guys is given by uh, this, this space here. Uh, then the natural guess is that this, um, the, the propagator, which in this case would be an evolution family, will converge to the projector onto the space band by phi. And in fact, this is um, the case. This has been shown in a paper by uh, Wolfgang Tarrant and Kortos in 2014 um, under the assumption that the spectral gap for all these operators is um, bounded away from from zero. Um, they need a technical assumption uh, on smoothness of this um, uh, of this dependence on time of the quadratic form. This could be slightly weakened in a paper um, I wrote last year with Afida Lazari. Uh, so we only need measurability of time, which is already better because this um, reminds us of the situation we were working on with the with jumps. And they can also weaken a bit uh, the this condition on the spectral gap. In fact, we only need that um, um, that we have an L1 lock um, spectral gap that satisfies this kind of, so this Cesaro-like um, type of um, asymptotic behavior. So in this case, we can show that uh, we can even have operating on convergence to this um, projector. So far so good, but this is um, not exactly the case we were thinking of before, because for instance, this condition is not satisfied by the toy model. In the toy model, we have two evolution equations. One has um, 
um, you remember, so you had two intervals, one with Neumann boundary conditions, so the spectral gap is actually um, strictly negative, but the other one, um, you have um, two different Neumann intervals, and in this case, the second eigenvalues will again be zero, uh, and then it's not clear whether this condition will be satisfied. Uh, so we started um, searching literature for similar results, and we, so Stefan von Korsi and I, found uh, a very interesting theory, um, which I was not aware of, um, it's from linear algebra, in fact. So the question is the following. Um, assume you have a certain set of, uh, of matrices, of finite matrices, they call them B1, Bm. Um, in linear algebra, such sets are called, or sets of matrices are called LCP, so right convergent product sets, if all infinite products of this kind um, converge. So no matter how you draw your um, uh, matrices from this uh, family S, uh, sigma, then all these products must converge uh, for k going to infinity. Um, this is a very important topic in, in, uh, in, um, uh, in linear algebra. And in fact, there is a very famous paper by Ingrid Aubuchy and uh, Jeffrey Legaris from 92 with a, um, well, a rating and um, an improvement at the same time in 2001. Um, so let me just mention the most important um, results in this paper. So first of all, um, okay, there are um, sufficient and uh, necessary conditions for a set to be an RCP. So in particular, you need some kind of generalization of notion of spectral radius. Uh, and this, the fact that this inequality holds is a um, necessary condition for, for a matrix set to be an RCP. But in fact, what they also observe is that, so they wonder whether the Assume that this uh, that this um, that all this um, sequence converge, all this product converge. So, can you say something about limiting um, um, the limiting object? So, is it continuous? And if so, I mean, with respect to which matrix? Okay, they introduce the notion of sequence matrix, which is uh, defined precisely here, some kind of um, um, sharper version or cleverer, smarter version of what's used. To be called a uh, Hamming distance in a computer science. Um, but it's a very natural notion of distance for these uh, sequences. Uh, and so okay, they say that the limit object of this um, infinite product is continuous if and only if um, they all these matrices B1 have the same, um, sorry, BI, have the same uh, eigenspace associated with the largest um, eigenfunction. Uh, this eigenspace is one dimensional. So you basically have for all these matrices, you have a dominant eigenvalue. Um, and if this kind of splitting um, is valid, so you can split your space into a uh, dominant eigenspace plus um, something uh, plus a remainder. And on this remainder, then you, you need, you have a, a, an RCP set. So for those of you who are uh, familiar with um, the theory of, um, well, or sem with semi-groups in, in general, but in particular with the theory of um, um, semi-group decompositions, this will not be um, very new. And if this, in fact, should, this rang a bell in, in, um, uh, in the minds of Stefano and, and myself. Uh, so you will see in the following how we use this, this idea in the context of uh, infinite dimensional space. So if I want to basically to condense the, the um, main idea and the, in, the, in this research by, by Stefano Bonacorsi myself and um, Stefano's student Francesca Cottini who at a certain point joined us, uh, is to start from the ideas of Dubchi and Lagarius, but instead of um, ensuring that individual trajectories of these products converge, um, we wanted to start the statistics of convergent tra trajectories. So we were, um, we were willing to allow certain trajectories not to converge, but we wanted to see whether we can ensure that most trajectories do converge. Um, so let me make this more precise, again, uh, using as a, an example uh, my previous toy model. Uh, so assume that um, 
we are jumping back and forth between these two um, systems uh, with same probability. Um, so you see, because um, so if you stay, if you if you start here and you at each time it decide whether you are going here and then this is one or it's zero, and then if you're here, then you can go back. It is a zero, or you stay here. This is one. So you see, all, all trajectories um, can be um, can be described uh, by a zero one sequence. So basically, this is a dyadic um, representation of a number in zero one. Um, so the question is, if each trajectory is a, is a number, is a real number between zero and one, how large probability is to converge can be just described, this question is equivalent to asking how large is the measure um, of this um, of the set of, uh, of the subset in zero one, of the set of converging sequences. So this is the main uh, theorem we got in our paper. Um, so assume you have a finite set sigma of uh, generators, A1 to AM. Uh, and we need certain um, technical assumptions, or maybe not so technical, I will show uh, later. Uh, so we need all these operators AJ to generate an analytic and contractive stemmy group on a Hilbert space. Uh, we need all of them to have um, no um, imaginary spectrum, or if ever, then at most in the zero. They, so the, the, only, um, uh, the only spectral value on the imaginary axis is it, is, can be zero. Uh, and um, we would like to have all of them to have compact resolvent. So the embedding of uh, the domain of AJ into the Hilbert space must be compact. Um, if all AJ are drawn with the same probability from the set sigma at each um, time step tk, then we can show that this propagator here converges um, in operator norm towards the projector, the orthogonal projector onto um, the intersection space of all null spaces of the generators. So you have m generators, you take the intersection of their null spaces and almost surely you will have that this propagator will converge Towards um, towards them, no matter what this um, Markov process X n here does. So this this describes the switching between one system and the next one. Um, okay, the, this theorem is um, I think it will be shown um, it will be proved in detail in the next talk by Stefano Bonacorsi. So let me just uh, give the um, main ideas, which are also the most semi-group theoretical ones. Um, so the proof actually relies uh, in an essential way on two lemmas, which has nothing to do with, with um, stochastics. So I, this is, these are those I'm going to present. Uh, the first one is the following. Um, so we assume that you have a, a contractive analytic semigroup on a Hilbert space, uh, and that it has that the generators compact solvent, and again this condition on the on the minimum peripheral spectrum. Uh, then we can prove that this condition holds. So you have not only um, uh, decay in the norm of the orbits, as you would expect from contractivity, but you actually have strong decay, so strict monotonicity, uh, as soon as x is not in the null space of A of course, because otherwise it will be constant. Um, and this is surprising because I mean this is exactly the, the behavior we'd expect generally from semigroup, but in fact the proof, as I will show you in a second, will rely very much on the property of uh, relativity. So it doesn't seem to be true in general cases, not even in uh, general Banach spaces. Okay, and then if this is true, then it's easy to 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 follow. Uh, I mean to derive that uh, the null space of A agrees with this um, subspace of the fixed space of the same group. So in general, it would be that the null space of A is equal to the uh, set of fixed um, vectors under the semigroup. group. But in, in fact, this is even a um, stronger assumption, uh, stronger assertion. Okay, proof. Uh, first of all, it's easy to see that one only needs to focus on the case of injective um, uh, generator because otherwise you can just reduce it to, to, this, uh, to the injective case. So if you have an injective um, generator, then 
zero because of the compact resolvent property, then zero is an isolated eigenvalue. Um, on one hand, we know that um, by the Jakos de Leuf, uh, Glicksberg decomposition, the semigroup applied to, um, uh, to a vector outside the null space of the generator will converge to zero, of course. Uh, so now let us introduce this um, functional um, or this function phi. So phi maps each t uh, on the positive real line to the squared norm of, of the um, orbit. So because um, semigroup is analytic, it's not hard to see that uh, this function is real analytic. Uh, now assume that the strict monotonicity we are as, um, asserting is not true. So we have two different times t and t prime so that the orbit has the same norm. Um, but because of the um, um, so if, if this is true, then what can show by contractivity of the semigroup that the function is constant on the cell on the whole interval t t prime. And then if it, this function is constant on the, on the interval t t prime, then it's constant everywhere because of the ident identity theorem from uh, for uh, real analytic functions. And uh, this gives a contradiction to the fact that uh, phi of zero um, is just the norm squared of the um, vector x and that the um, semigroup converges to zero. Uh, so you see this relatively um, natural assertion um, depends very much on the uh, on, on this technical assumption of the semigroup, and it's really unclear to us whether this can these assumptions can be weakened. The second main ingredient in the proof of the main theorem uh, is this um, um, second monotonicity dilemma again, uh, in this case for products of orthogonal projectors. Um, so assume that you have a family of orthogonal projectors on a Hilbert space, um, each of them projects onto this uh, range PI. Well, and then uh, if at least one of those are compact, then you can show that this product here, so um, the composition of all of them times the orthogonal to the projector onto this K, this norm is strictly less than one. Of course, uh, less or equal than one is clear, but the issue is whether we can have a strictly less than one. And also in this case, compactness is essential as we will show you in a second. The point is that um, this, this uh, relies on a um, famous um, property in, in geometry of Banach spaces. The norm of a compact operator in a reflexive Banach space uh, is attained. So there is a, a, um, a vector x such that um, the norm of um, compact operator t applied to x is the same as the norm of t. So in this case, we apply this to this uh, composition here. Uh, so in particular, um, we can find vector x such that this um, property is, uh, this equation is satisfied. Um, okay, and then uh, by certain um, algebraic manipulation, then we see that, uh, that this is true. So, uh, okay, this, this proof of the main theorem will, I, I will leave to, to Stefano. Um, let me just mention the following. So we proved this, uh, this main theorem for this, um, for this series of, um, uh, under these assumptions. And these assumptions are obviously um, satisfied as soon as we have a self-adjoint positive semi-definite operator. Um, with, yeah. Um, but the interesting thing is that we can consider also other classes. I wouldn't say more general, but other classes of different properties or processes. Uh, we can even consider eventually positive um, uh, semigroups, as in the case, as in the talk by Federica and yesterday by Sahiba. So, in particular, if, apply, if we apply to this well, yeah, the time uh, is model over. here, so we will finish. Finish. Yes, I will conclude in a second. Um, so, okay, even you. if we.
if we have that the system converges to a project onto uh, this space here. Okay, uh, I think I will um, uh, I will skip uh, this application to graphs I had in mind. So um, just say that if we we can we can prove that even if you um, if you have a certain family of non-connected graphs, uh, so we don't have in general convergence to one dimensional space. Um, by suitably switching between different graphs, then we will have convergence as again an application of, of this theorem. Uh, and okay, I think this is this really too too far, so I, I will skip it. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And uh, if you could stop sharing the screen and let us welcome questions and comments. Anybody uh, would like to comment or ask a question? Well, I have a question. If okay, I may. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, tell you, so in, in this main theorem, you, you mentioned, I missed, I think, this from the audio. You mentioned that you don't know whether these are, um, can be generalized assumptions. Was this referring to the proposition? The one you um, thanked uh, Jochen and Marvin Blumer for. Exactly, yes. So, so, so what, was, what would be the question and which assumption would you then like to have there instead? Uh, just a second. So let me uh, show this again. Um, okay, can you see this again? Yeah. 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 Um, well, okay, so the, the question is um, under which Assumptions are general as possible. You can have that the orbit is um, that the orbit norm is strictly decreasing as, as soon as you are away from the null space. So whether you really need uh, all this machinery, where you really need um, Hilbert space uh, and contractivity mm -hmm. and analyticity. I mean, this is necessary for our proof, but I would have thought. But this is. So first of all, the first active analytic semigroups on reflexive minor spaces, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, this is already unclear. Yeah. And for instance, whether analyticity is really, really needed. Yeah. Well, the proof really heavily rests on this, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. sure. Oh, th thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Daniel, for this nice talk. I, I like I liked it a lot. And again, so... Uh, thanks. <sighs> okay. Delio, we have, I think there's, you're breaking, so you cannot hear you. Uh, but in any case, thanks for the talk. And if you could stop sharing, uh, great. Thank you very much. Uh,